Today we're going to experiment with the two types of ammunition commonly used with the Baker rifle, namely the patched round ball and the paper cartridge. By far the most useful reference on the Baker rifle is DeWitt Bailey's British military flintlock rifles from 1740 to 1840. In it, he's included important information on the types of ammunition and its use. By way of summary, I'll quote from his own conclusion. Page 155 states, From the rather jumbled mess of often contradictory information, certain basic features of Baker rifle ammunition appear. Ammunition was initially available as either loose powder, patches and balls, or as paper cartridges made up with and without ready patched balls. So clearly there were three types of ammunition. But why? The answer was due to the varying nature of the fight in Napoleonic times. Riflemen were expected to engage at range using the accuracy of their rifles to their advantage. But there were also times when they had to fight at closer range, that of the common musket. For longer range, forced ball patched with cloth or leather could be used to greatest effect while if and when the battle closed to ranges where the accuracy of the Baker rifle was, shall we say, overkill, then simple cartridges with naked round balls could be used, which both increased the rate of fire and were accurate enough. This video will examine the ends of the scale in regards to ammunition effectiveness. On one hand, the patched round ball, and on the other, the naked ball packaged in a paper cartridge. Bailey also notes that the use of the powder horn, flask, and forced ball was essentially discontinued partly through the Napoleonic Wars. Presumably, it was because the paper cartridge, which included a patched round ball, was just as effective. Bailey is somewhat unclear of the cartridges used during the Napoleonic Wars, which included patched round balls. He has, however, included this method of making these cartridges, purported to be the invention of a Colonel Massaroon, these date from 1832, and as such post-date the Napoleonic Wars by some time. This, however, is the only illustration of any method used to make such cartridges. You can see here how the patched round ball is nested in the open end of the cartridge. These are certainly an interesting topic of experimentation, but we're going to save that for another video. Before we demonstrate the use of the paper cartridge, we'll explore how it was made. There were two types of round ball used. Those that were intended to be patched were of the 22 to the pound variety, whilst those intended for use in cartridges without a patch were 20 to the pound. The round balls that I typically use with patching in my baker weigh 312 grains, which is approximately 22.4 to the pound. I had experimented with some other bullets that I had. These weighed 330 grains and measured 0.604. I found that by the time they were wrapped in the paper of the cartridge, they were a very tight fit in the muzzle, and as fouling would be a greater concern when shooting unlubed cartridges, I elected to use the same smaller ball as I use with patching. When shooting patched round ball, the tight fitting and lubricated patch and ball combination has a cleaning effect in wiping the bore and keeping what fouling remains soft. With dry cartridges, this function is not present and fouling builds up, making tight-fitting ammunition difficult or impossible to ram. Cartridges for the Baker using unpatched balls would have been very similar, if not identical, to those used with the carbines of the era, and they were completely conventional in construction. The paper that the cartridge was made from was a trapezoid in shape, with the long side being 6 inches, the short side being 2.6 inches, and the width being 5.15 inches. Now I modified the paper somewhat by trimming one inch off its height. This allowed for two wraps exactly of the ball at the end of the cartridge. The first step was to place the mandrel and the ball on the trapezoid, leaving one inch at the ball end for choking. The paper was then rolled tightly around both. Once satisfied that the roll of paper was tight enough, I then moved to the choking string and choked the end of the cartridge off. Once this was done, I then unwrapped it and made a slight choke above the ball. This would ensure a good powder and ball seal within the cartridge.
choking complete, and then tied off the bottom of the cartridge with some string and a reef knot. Excess was trimmed with a pair of scissors. The next step was to tie a piece of string at the choke above the ball. As mentioned earlier, this will help prevent powder from leaking past the ball into the bottom of the cartridge. Again, the excess was trimmed with a pair of scissors. Then the excess paper was trimmed, ensuring to leave enough to maintain the choke at the end of the ball. Unlike the version with the .604 ball, this version fit nicely inside the muzzle. With the cartridge rolled, the next step was to charge it with a service charge of 95 grains or 3 and one half drams. At this point, I deviated slightly from the historical by electing to fold rather than twist and tie the opening of the cartridge. This somewhat complicated foldover shown here is actually poached from American Civil War ammunition. It makes for a nice, squared-off, well-sealed cartridge and does not impact its functionality at all. Historically, the powder end of the cartridge was choked and tied in a similar manner to the ball end. With the cartridges complete, it was now time to test their accuracy versus the past round ball. For these tests, I elected to shoot a 10 round group. Loading and firing with past round ball has already been discussed in previous videos, so I won't go into it in particular detail. The service charge of 95 grains, with the patch and round ball forced down on top, primed with 4F powder is the way I typically shoot the Baker. Priming out of a small flask with extra fine gunpowder was not particularly historical. Indeed, the 2F powder that I use in the main charge is nearly as effective for priming as is the 4F that I'm using here. Although it's not super slow motion and I wish I had such a camera, this sequence shows the Ignition sequence of a flintlock rifle nicely. The powder in the pan flashes, igniting the main charge. Well, here we are. Without being too smug about it, that was pretty much where I was aiming. I had the post at the bottom of the pole here, and the rounds are pretty much six inches above that, which is pretty much how I've sighted the rifle in. The group. Measures about eight inches total spread with uh, the lowest and farthest away one being down at the bottom here. But generally, as you can see here, a decent pattern. The majority are, oh, six inches or so. That's pretty much what I've come to expect from my rifle. Well, let's see how the cartridges do. Now, because the cartridges are being used in an historical context, the priming is done before the loading. Now, you may at once realize that after priming, a certain amount of gunpowder has been left out of the cartridge. But as this is only a couple of grains worth, the effect on the main charge is negligible. I should make mention of the technique of loading here, whereby the empty part of the cartridge was placed in the barrel first, before the ball. Of course, one of the concepts with a paper cartridge in a muzzle-loading weapon is the fact that there is a great deal of windage between the ball and the inside of the barrel. This, of course, is necessary to maintain ease of loading even if the barrel is fouled. This extra piece of paper was important, for as it was rammed down on top of the powder, it formed a rudimentary sabot behind the ball. This sabot performed two functions. One, it limited, but did not stop the escape of gas past the ball when the main charge was fired. And two, it helped stabilize the ball on its path down the barrel, increasing accuracy. 
As you might expect, with all that extra windage and no tight-fitting patch, ramming was exceptionally easy. Again, the opportunity presented itself to show in a bit of stop motion the sequence of a flintlock's firing. First, the cock falls, making the flint strike the frizzen. As the flint scrapes down the face of the frizzen, also known as the hammer, it shaves off bits of metal which glow red hot and fall into the pan as sparks. These sparks ignite the powder resting in the pan which has been exposed as the frizzen rocked forward. The heat and flame from the flashing powder in the pan ignites the main charge, which then propels the bullet down the barrel. Well, I can't say I wasn't expecting this. The group is a lot bigger. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine down there. So we've got most of the rounds on target and certainly the ones that are on target are well within the striking distance, let's say. So, at 100 yards, firing with the paper cartridge would definitely have been lethal with the Baker rifle. Beyond 100 yards, we're going to start to see a little bit of inaccuracy start creeping in and affecting whether or not we can hit the target. Looks to be about a 17 inch spread. The second test would be a rapid fire test. First up, three rounds of patched round ball. In order to be a true test, I included the time spent loading the first round as part of the total. What I didn't do was show the loading sequences for the subsequent rounds. I could have played some nice music or something, but I thought I'd just spare you that extra time. It's important to realize that in some of the documentation of the era, it states that the round balls were pre-patched and held in the pouch that way. This would certainly save some time from me having to fish out individual patches from the pouch. That said, I made sure there was at least three patches very easily accessible, so that the time difference between a separate patch and ball and a pre-patched ball would be minimized. Three rounds loaded and fired in one minute and 55 seconds. As any educated guesser might assume, this was going to take a lot less time than shooting with patched round ball. The basis was the same as the previous test. Three rounds, including loading time. I elected to use the line infantry drill used with the brown bess of casting a boat, transitioning the rifle to the left hand side for ramming. It was a little bit difficult to use the one-handed ramming technique without reversing the ramrod as was intended to be done with the brown bess. We just saw some evidence of bad muscle memory. Being accustomed to shoot the baker with the priming aspect done at the end of the sequence, I instinctively dropped the butt before I primed. This of course is not correct for the drills that I'm using and stands to illustrate the importance of daily drill and a soldier's effectiveness on the battlefield. With the paper cartridge, those same three rounds took only one minute and nine seconds. The subject of Baker rifle ammunition is quite comprehensive. Here, we explored the capabilities and characteristics of two of the three different kinds. The slowest to load, but presumably most accurate, patched round ball, also known as forced ball, and the quicker to load, but less accurate, naked round ball in a paper cartridge. Both had their use on the battlefield, as the situation would dictate. In a follow-up to this video, we'll explore the paper cartridges that included a patched round ball. We'll try the 1832 version as explained earlier, as well as perhaps some others that I can dream up. Stand by, because the results are bound to be interesting. As usual, thanks for watching.